Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to get a little more personal on this one. So I might be a little more opinionated on this one. Okay. <laughs> um, but you can, you can call me on it afterwards. Um, I did want to say thank you to the uh, manager of the Institute of Policy Research for inviting all of us and to the uh, Winnipeg Free Press Cafe for hosting us, including Shannon here, and all you fine people for coming out and listening to us this evening. So, uh, first of all, I'm really happy that these kinds of conversations are happening now, that we are bringing this up, that this is, um, th this conversation about arts and culture is, is happening at this, this time here now, because I think it's a really great time of opportunity. And it's especially timely as we're getting into the summer festival season, right? There is Jazz Fest and Kids Fest and Bokorama and Fringe Fest, and of course the Folk Festival, July 9th to 12th. <laughs> And, and you know, those are just a few of the, of the festivals that we have in and around the province and even in and around the city. Um, everyone knows now that arts and culture needs more funding, and I'm not here to talk about that. What I want to talk about is the connection between policy, education, and public support. And the cycle that's created, in, in, which in turn improves our community. So Manitoba is a powerhouse when it comes to culture. We all know that. It's why we're all here tonight, it's why we all care about it, it's why we all support the events that I just talked about. But we, we've talked a little bit about policy, Tom's given the history of it, specifically in Canada, specifically in Manitoba. And what he didn't mention is the last time uh, policy was created in this province was in the 90s. That's before the internet, guys. <laughs> okay, think about that for a second, because there has been so much that has changed in the past 20 years, 25 years, and not the least of which is what he's talking about with the, with the music industry. So lots of change, lots has changed. Now, in, in talking about my own background, because that's what I have to, to draw from, when I went to school um, in, in the 80s, I, I had the benefit of being in a, in a nice Winnipeg suburb that had lots of great opportunities. We had music classes when I was in uh, elementary school, when I got to high school, I was in a concert band, concert choir, jazz band, jazz choir, and the school musical. I ended up graduating actually with a whole extra year of credits because of all the art stuff I was able to do in the, in the four years I was there. Well, those, those kinds of programs don't exist at my high school anymore. They, they've just gone away. They've been deemed less important. And uh, I have a problem with that. Because when I, when I had those opportunities, and I actually had the public support, of, or public support of my own family, I guess that's public, right? They, they encouraged me to do all kinds of cultural things. So I, in, in addition to the things I was doing through school, I did music lessons. We went to the folk festival. I started going to the folk festival when I was six years old. But we also took part in all kinds of, of events. We went to the symphony. We went to um, kids programming at the local library that was artistic. You know, there's all kinds of things that, and I was lucky that I had that in my family to, to, to give me that kind of upbringing. But the educational opportunities were, were a really key part for me. And, and the kinds of things I was able to benefit from, from like I said, don't exist now. I, uh, I was talking to a teacher friend of mine who uh, teaches at Vincent Massey Collegiate. And she was talking about all the great stuff that they do there. Now that's not my high school. But um, and I, I was amazed that kids could get credit for things like digital photography, which is creative. And they had music programs, which continue to be creative. But I said, is that, now is that a standard for your school in this day and age? And she said, no, no, we're lucky because of where we are. And I said, so what, what about kids in, in areas that maybe don't have that kind of neighborhood that they're in? Maybe they're, they're from a, like, an inner city neighborhood. And she's like, well, I don't think they have those kinds of programs. And she's right, because as a folk festival, we go into schools and we have a musical mentors program, which takes local artists into the school system and helps teach kids about music. It helps them to learn how to write a song, helps them learn to uh, appreciate music, 
and then they get they get an opportunity they don't otherwise get, and that's because a cultural organization like ours goes in and does it. We take the initiative to go out and do it. Not that it like now we're lucky that the education system allows us to do that, that they permit us to come in to do that, but it's not it shouldn't be that way. They should inherently be getting that. Like I was able to do what I was in in school, and it's just not happening. So I think it has to be a mandated part of education in all areas from the earliest age. It's as important as math and science and literacy and social studies. And we need a, 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 to support the, the leadership within the school system and educators to make that happen. We as a community have to say that's important. We all love to support cultural events in this province and we all need to ensure that we communicate that as well. We have to help tell those stories. That's one thing you know we've, we've talked about as an industry is that we're not really all that good at talking about who we are and what we are. I mean, it's kind of partly that we're, we're prairie people. And we don't like to brag, and we don't like to, to really tell our virtues. But if we don't, who else is gonna? I mean, otherwise we get known for things like mosquitoes and weather and all that stuff. But everybody knows we've got super strong cultural events here. And so we've got to remind ourselves of that as well, because it all, brings us to stay here and to, to want to live here. I, I was in the film and television industry for 13 years before I joined the Folk Festival. And there was lots of stuff going on in the film and television industry throughout the 90s. And there is still things going on now. But it was a really exciting time. The, the, the cable television industry was growing. Um, the, the CTF that Tom mentioned earlier was, was put in place and then made a line item in the budget, which means the Canadian Television Fund was providing funding for Canadian producers to make Canadian television. And all of that uh, was, it was really exciting and we actually, for a long period of time, there was a, a regional incentive which encouraged broadcasters to bring in programming from regional producers. So that's people outside Toronto, and Montreal, and Vancouver. So we actually were able to benefit from that as, as, a, as a Manitoba producer. I worked for Frantic Films for 13 years. And we did these, uh, these series, you know, it's the Quest series, where we, uh, people, we put them in historical situations and made them live for a certain period of the style of, oh, 1870s pioneers, or 1890s fur traders, or 1920s, um, Newfoundland outpost uh, families. And, and these, these were things that were created by Manitoba Company that helped show Manitoba and other Canadian history um, to Canadians and got them excited about their culture in a new and exciting way. Um, if I was going to try and further my career outside of the, uh, the city limits of Winnipeg, I was going to have to move to Toronto eventually. You know, despite the regional incentives, Really, that's where the industry lived. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be here, I wanted to stay here, I wanted to live here because of what Winnipeg has to offer with all these cultural events, with all these <coughs> incredibly creative people, the artists, the musicians, uh, and, and the people that run the organizations that, that, that make Winnipeg the cultural place that it is. So I, I just felt that in order for me to feel complete as a, as a person, I needed to be here. Not in some big city, not making big TV, but doing something that was really connected to the community here. Because culture is not a siloed kind of thing. And I'm, and I'm afraid that a lot of people think about it in that way. Um, I, I worry that government thinks about it in that kind of way, that it, it's, it's only, it's this one thing and it's this one part of the community and we have to focus on the artists, we have to focus on um, the, the symphony and the orchestra and the ballet, but those, sure, that's all part of it, absolutely. But it infiltrates all part of our lives, all parts of our lives, in all employment sectors, whether it's healthcare, justice, or manufacturing, or finance, we see its impact, impact on other disciplines. Um, Alan talked about architecture and fashion and even food. And these kinds of things employ a lot of people. And then non-creative sector organizations are actually more successful when they have creative, uh, two minutes? Two minutes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, 
they're more successful when they have uh, creative people working there. And that actually comes from the ability to have arts and culture in your life, like I was able to do. And be able to experience it both formally and informally as you're growing up. So, what I'm trying to get to is there is a bit of a cycle here, okay? Um, when you create strong policy, you'll, you'll you, and you see mandating of, of, of culture and arts in, in somebody's education and experience that leads to a, a more cultured view and a more creative view of what the job opportunities are in and in around Winnipeg, the quality of life that you've got here, and then that ultimately leads to a better community, which then means we are all want to support that because we see the impact of it, and, and then that leads back to better policy. So, uh, I'm going to skip some parts because I think I'm going to And I want to I want to say that I, I we need policy here. It's it's outdated. It needs updating. And those of us who live and work in the sector, as I do now. Um, are willing to make this happen. And we know it commits to the greater good. And you know everybody else knows it commits to the greater good as well. And so we want to say, yeah, yeah, government needs to update policy, but we're not saying that they have to do it alone. We're willing to be there, right there with them, and, and help make it happen. You know, We don't want to just sit there and say, yeah, you guys deal with it, and then we'll complain about it once it's actually changed. We want to be part of the process. In fact, Alan and Tom and I are all part of Manitobans for the Arts which is about to publish a new policy platform for all the government parties. So they know what's important to the community. We all work together to canvas all the different organizations, big and small, to say, hey, what's important to you? What are the important parts of, of arts and culture for you in Manitoba? What are important parts of the creative industries for Manitoba? And we, wanna, and we want everybody to know that we are all on the same page. We are not silent. We do not work independently, we all work together. And like I said, I think there's something in the air right now in this province, and especially in the city, there is so much positive change happening. I can feel it. There's this sort of, like, I always, I, I've been saying for a long time, I think there's gonna be this renaissance, like there was in the turn of the century, when all these big and beautiful theaters were built, and we were the Chicago of the North. That's gonna happen again. That is happening again, in fact. And we are gonna be such a huge focus of the rest of the world because we are gonna be so strong on everything that we do and arts and culture is at the heart of it. So stay tuned.